My guest today is Joshua Dixon, who is a film director and producer living in Bangkok, Thailand, but originally from Fort Worth, Texas. Now, he originally was a DP turned commercial director and then made his way into line producing features and eventually directing. He is also a founding partner of the well-known Southeast Asia production company, Umbrella Films, and also Post House Cut, Mix, and Color, both in Bangkok. Now, in 2023, Joshua launched the film development company, Peripheral Pictures, with Hellhound as its debut film. Currently, Peripheral has a slate of over 10 films actively being developed. Now, Hellhound is about a tired and ready-for-retirement assassin who is ready to leave his life behind. A bit of John Wick, but with more acting, something John Wick 3 and 4 just didn't have. So let's welcome film director of the intense and action-packed Hellhound, Joshua Dixon, to the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Well, I've got to ask, uh, you're from Fort Worth, Texas, and I film from the north yep. side of Houston. How did you end up in the Thailand film industry? Um... So it's it's a very, very long story, of course. I'll give you the condensed version. Um, I had uh, gotten a job actually working on on a film in Cambodia. Uh, I really fell in love with Southeast Asia, um, was working for some great filmmakers there. During that time, I got uh, some time to just take a vacation for probably, you know, three or four days to Bangkok. Saw that there was a lot of, a lot of, of opportunity in the commercial market. Um, and I actually just kind of went after it at that point. So I opened up a commercial uh, production company at that point. Well, um, Th Thailand yeah. is a very hot uh, market for film right now, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's massive. Yeah, it's massive. So just in the 10 years that I've been here, it's grown massively. Yeah. So yeah, you've lived in, huge. so you've lived in Thailand for the last 10 years. Uh, yeah, it's 10 or more. Um, we don't have the seasons here, so it's very, very like hard to gauge a lot of that. Um, but I, I was back and forth between the U.S. for probably about a year and a half um, until I made the full transition. So right over 10 years. Well, yeah. how did you come across the script for Hellhound? Um, so it's actually written by a producing partner of mine, Nico. Uh, he's also the DP on the project. Um but he and I, we've been shooting together commercials for probably seven years now, six, seven years together. Uh, we were trying to get a TV pilot off the ground. It was not working. COVID was there. Uh, and it was, you know, every time we'd get a chance to try to, to go and shoot this TV pilot, a COVID lockdown would hit or, you know, we'd run into another, another uh, you know, roadblock. And um, we just decided to... You know, I don't know. The TV pilot wasn't working out. So we said, you know what? We can't do this TV pilot. So we decided to write a new script. Nico uh, went to actually screen or sorry, he went to school for for screenwriting and he wrote it uh, during one of the COVID lockdowns. Um, and so we we did it in a way that was not, you know, the normal way. I, I told him, don't worry about the budget write it with an unlimited budget. And uh, this is kind of what we ended up with. You know, it was more expensive scene after expensive scene. And, and we just kind of like kind of work backwards from there to back into the whole thing. So well, did you film this, uh, during COVID or right at the, or, or maybe basically post COVID, uh, right at the end of it. Right. So right, right at the end of when the, or right when the world was opening up, we were able to, but we we were in a very, very fortunate position. Um, Thailand had had sealed the borders like very, very quickly. Um, so like getting in and out of Thailand was difficult, but we we hardly, you know, COVID was not um, as widespread here. And so we were able to carry on with production with the, within the country quite, quite a lot. Um, you know, not many people were wearing masks. Um, so, I mean, it was actually kind of a, it was, it was a bit of a haven in a way. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we were able I, to shoot. Yeah, I get that. We we live in a conservative county here, so uh, you know everybody was griping about COVID across the country, but we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, well, at that point, everyone, no matter which side of the the fence you're on, everyone was like, whatever at that point, you know, like <laughs> this was, you know, the end of the third year or something. And it was just like, you know, we need we needed to figure out a way to make this work anyways. Right. Like everyone was at that point. Yeah. Well, what was it like work? What was it like working with a script? You tell your screenwriter mm. to write the script and don't worry about the budget. Does that free up the writing process? Um, yeah, I think it definitely frees up the writing process. It creates other problems down the road, of course, because then you have to figure out like how to either deliver it or you have to rewrite again, right? Or take it out or, or, or however you want to approach it. Um, we, we, though, Nico and I had been, like I said, we've been shooting together for seven years. Um, and I own a production company here uh, and a post house. So there was a lot of stuff already in our back pocket that we, we, we were going to just put in from the beginning, right? Like we already knew these locations or people that we knew had, you know, these bars or these clubs or, you know, these, these crazy locations available. So like that was already stuff that we were, we were still putting in. And so like, we were just adding stuff to what we already had available, I guess, you know, we we're just adding stuff on top of it. Well, yeah. tell us about the story of Hellhound. Yeah. So, um, Hellhound it's, it's, it's about an assassin, right. Who's, who's doing his last job. Um, and basically he makes one minor mistake uh, and it's just basically, it's a delay in, in the sense of judgment. Uh, and when he does that, things literally just spiral out of control. Um, and a lot of people say like, well, that sounds like a typical, um, storyline. And I mean, of course, any movie you can, you can see, like you've seen multiple stories done over and over and over. Um, but the thing is that like, it's, it's very much just a, a, a very, very dark, uh, aggressive film, right. That just keeps going, going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so like, that's really what we were after was the, 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 the danger that we were, we were after in the script. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the storyline, even though if you just looked at the, the basis of the storyline, yes, it's been done yeah. before, but that type yeah. of storyline always works. It always draws audiences, you know, John Wick was that way. But a lot of people may not even notice that even the Hitman's bodyguard with Samuel Jackson and Ron Reynolds was the exact of same course. way. Ryan made a of course. You know, a little tactical error there in his own little character's career and it, you yep. know, the rest of the movie spiraled out spiraled spiraled out of control. Right, exactly. I mean, that's that's really seriously what we're after um is a different take on it. Uh you know, I think that that you you're, you're no matter what, like we've gotten so many, you know, critics and reviews on, on the project already. Right. And like, you always have to like, take that with, you know, a grain of salt and also remember that, um, you know, we still made the movie. Right. And we were able to make it in a remarkable way. Right. We, we, there was a lot of other stuff that went into it. And, and of course, you know, like we're artists at heart, but you know, we're also responsible for making a movie that sells as well at the same time. So there's a lot of boxes you're trying to check um, whenever you're trying to make a movie that's successful as well at that, that, you know, yeah. like, traveling that same road. So, well, how did yeah. you cast the film? Because you have some very well-known talent. Of course, Louis Mandalore, Thanks. who I've had the opportunity yeah. to interview. You had Van Quattro. And then yeah. you had a bit high, uh, pens ring arm, uh, in yeah. this film as well. And I recognized all three of them. So how did you cast? Yeah. It? Yeah. Um, so Vitaya, right. We're here in Bangkok. So we're always around him. Like we're all, we always see each other at industry mixers and that sort of thing. So like we, we've known him or known of him. Um, so getting, getting, you know, in touch with him was pretty simple and easy. Um, he liked us, uh, we begged him kind of a thing, you know? And so he's, he said, okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, and uh, it was great to have him, man. We were, we were really excited because we wrote the part for him. Um, Luis, we actually wrote the part for Luis as well. Luis is very, very good friends with Nico, the writer and producer. So he, he knew him before, right, from other projects. So Luis is also a director and Nico shot for him a few times. Um, so that's really how Luis got involved in the project. And this is my first time meeting and working with Luis and, and I do it at, you know, again, he was fantastic. Van Quattro was, is from my hometown, right? Um, or he's from Dallas, right? Right next to us. So actually, I think he's from Fort Worth. 
Um, so we found him on a casting website, believe it or not. So like I'm over here in Thailand, we're casting everyone, everyone we're shortlisting, you know, there's two or three cities around the world, LA, um, New York and whatnot. Right. But then the, the guy who stuck out was from Fort Worth, Texas. And we've worked with the same people for years, but we've never even met or heard of each other before, before this project. So it's kind of a cool little destiny. Yeah. Well, full circle for, there. for you being, for you being the director of Hellhound, what was it like to direct Luis Mandalore? Um, I would say that, that first off, you know, being a first time director, um, I'm, I was trying to go into it with a very, very open mind, right? And also a very, um, I, I'm very big on collaboration. And I think that, um, so with, with, with our company, right? I can say it's like an entrepreneur that I have understood after working, you know, with a large staff at our company, the, the greatest thing that I can always uh, give myself and, and back is to understand how to collaborate with everyone and understand that people have great ideas and that you need to listen to them a bit. Uh, and so I took that kind of philosophy when I was directing this and doing that was a fantastic thing because Luis is, has so much experience, what he, what he gives to the process. Um, and even just like, a, you know, there's, when you're working at an, on an indie film at this level, you're always going to run into problems, right? Um, every film that's the case but with the kind of budget that we didn't have it was even you know even it's hyper focused so with that like nico and i are constantly figuring out how to problem solve or this thing ran out or we're running out of money or whatever it is right and so we're always figuring out what to do next and how to do it or solve it creatively and luis just adds another um element to it and of problem solving and uh, solutions, which is just fantastic. So, I mean, working with him was the correct, per he was the correct person to have on this project because he not only gives it, you know, 110% in front of camera, but it's also behind camera. Did, did he do any of the storyboarding for you? No, no. Uh, we, we definitely didn't have time, did not have time to do storyboarding at all. <laughs> so, had he had he uh, offered, I would have taken it, but I don't think that uh, we would have had time. Yeah, yes, I I know Louise's backstory. He is a storyboard artist, so I was kind of just curious if he if he storyboarded this film for you. But again, you have Van Quattro, who yeah. brought a lot of experience to the set. I mean, what did you learn yeah. from him while he was there? Um he so he has the natural like disposition we were looking for in this cast um um and so it was very i feel it was very natural not not to say that he's a a villain right like but but it just his his the way he delivers his lines his accent and everything um was just spot on and that's really like why we why we cast him because the first time we saw him, uh, you know, just just read read the his lines during his audition, just fantastic, man. Like it was just this whole um, very, it's a psychopath, and, and the way he he talks about about you know, I mean, obviously the script is what made him sound like a psychopath, but like his delivery on it's just perfect. You know, there was there was actually not a lot of. Um, altering what he's doing right so like with with this film i think i was very 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 fortunate to be able to find people who were doing things the way that we wanted you know without having to do much changing in their performance which is crazy so. yeah you know when i was when i was watching the film and with van's character probably about halfway through the film i'm like i don't trust this guy there's yeah, just yeah. some you know he has that he just has yeah. a very secretive underlying tone that something's just not right with yeah. him. And of course, yeah. as the film moves along, we find out exactly what happens. But yeah. one of the biggest elements of your film that I truly liked was that you kept the mindset of the assassin as an assassin. You didn't yeah. soften his demeanor at all, even in mm. the end. He knew he was still committing evil 
Why did you take yeah. that? Uh, why did you take that approach with that character? Um, I mean, I think I think that's one of the most important parts about this character. He understands truly what evil is himself too, right? Like he understands that he's a bad person. Um, and this is you know spoiler alerts uh, <laughs> right right now. So uh, the 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 last scene uh, or second to last scene. Right? Yeah, with he with the blonde girl. It. Exactly. He talks about it. You know, he says, you know, I'm evil. You think you're not evil. You're evil just like me. And his whole goal is to not just shut down what he does, but he's trying to get rid of the evil, you know, that, that he's caused in the world and anything that's connected to him. Um, and and I think it's really, really important to understand, like, that the, the following scene um I won't give it away, but don't give what, that what one happens, away. Yeah. 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 So what happens in that, right? Like that's going to start the whole process again, right. With a brand new generation. Um, and so like, this is this whole thing. And this is where it really becomes full circle is he's trying so hard to get rid of the evil, but he just started it back up again. For me, it was the best scene in the whole movie when he's sitting there, uh, you know, the blonde girl comes in yeah. and and why that scene works so well is because, again, you didn't soften his demeanor. Mm. You kept him truly evil from the beginning of the film uh, yeah. to the very end. He shows yeah. no mercy to anyone. He doesn't care who they are. And mm. but to me, that was Luis's. That's probably some of the best acting I've seen him do. Awesome, um, man. I, I agree. And it's I agree. incredible because you feel it. You see it. Yeah. You're as tense. You as the audience, you mm. feel the tension and you're like, oh, my gosh, what is he going to do? Because that clock is. Ticking. Yeah. No, no. De yeah. It's literally. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. So. So. So that's that's one of the, the 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 really cool parts about that scene. Right. Like, because we focus on a lot of close ups because the the intense face um during that scene um I'm, I'm really happy that like you caught that and you highlighted that because you know that's what I, what we were after so well, you know in the movie um the equalizer with denzel washington and he yep. always wears the watch and he always says yep. yeah you got about nine seconds so you know in about yeah. nine seconds something's gonna happen but in yeah, that yeah, yeah, scene yeah. he gives 60 yeah. seconds and you feel every second going by and you have no yeah. clue if something's going to happen or if yeah. nothing's going to happen. So yeah. that's what I love that type of element of tense surprise. Yeah. Awesome, man. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> well, yeah. I, there's also you've also created some uh, incredible characters in this film. Now, everyone knows Thailand is known for its sex tourism and you use mm. that as part of the underlying storyline. Was this to show a deeper level of corruption with the character of Tar and make him someone who you don't mess with? Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's. So if you actually go and look up this person, um, this is a bit of like fun trivia for people. Um, I don't know what I can actually talk about this. I'm just going to say everyone go look up this actor and just research his past. Um, and you'll understand that like we cast someone that's actually perfect for the role. Um, I, I, I just, I'll just leave it at that, man. Go, go, well, go research the guy. Were the tattoos real? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's all real. So I, this, was, I'm, I'm, I was, I was telling you this, this, his life is actually what we is very, very similar. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to give it away because I don't want to give out any yeah. spoiler alerts because I want everybody to see Hellhound, but Tar has his was, own secrets was, to hide. Was. Yeah. 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 So he has his own secrets to hide. Uh, was that storyline to show the level of personal conflict in his own choices, perhaps? Of course. Of course. I mean, that was the whole thing. I mean, it, it, it really makes you understand that, um, you know, People, how do you say this, man? There's, there's, I mean, there's so many levels to it, right? So, like, there's that, right? People aren't what you think they are, um, and then especially the, the the bullies of the world, right? Or people who are evil, right? They're they're covering up stuff ninety nine percent of the time, 
Um, I mean, you see that in people, I, I mean, just everywhere, you know, that there, anytime anyone uh, has, has issues and like, like they, they're out to get people for a certain subject, they usually struggle with that subject themselves. Wow. Now does, does Tar live in Thailand or is he an LA actor? Yeah. No, no, no. He's, he's here in Thailand full time. He speaks no English, <laughs> speaks no English, only Thai. Yeah. Wow. I mean, he was one scary dude. He is. It's very intense. Um, he's he's very, very well known for this character here in Thailand. Um, he's been in, you know, a few other uh, movies like A Prayer Before Dawn. He was one of the he was the lead prisoner in that. Um, and so, I mean, he's he's known for this, right? Like he did have this life at one time. So, I mean, he kind of has a bit of a testimony to the character. Man, what was the most, how was it for you directing or how did you direct the fight scenes? Um, so the fight scenes were all done with previs. Uh, we, we took about a week to, to map the whole thing out, right? Each fight scene was, was mapped out, choreographed, uh, and edited actually from rehearsals, right? From choreographed beforehand. So we knew all the locations we're going to be shooting at. We go out. Uh, with basically like a smaller camera and we choreograph all the scenes to work within that space that we're shooting. Uh, and I was actually still prepping the rest of the movie at this time. So Nico was out doing that. And then at night we would cut them. Uh, and then also like while Nico's doing all the choreography and rehearsals with everyone, um, he was sending me shots and I was just, you know, texting back notes to him. And so um, fortunately with technology, you know, we can do that really, really quickly. So, um, that helped out a lot, but just our, you know, the amount of money we had in the prep time, um, we had only like five days to rehearse it or choreograph and rehearse it. So we did all of that and then, uh, translated that onto the set. Well, what was the most difficult scene to, uh, film? Um, man, all of them, <laughs> uh, all of them were difficult, man. I don't know that there wasn't a, uh, difficult, um, probably the rooftop. Um, if you remember the the fight, because we were running against the clock um, behind the scenes so so much, uh, I think we had a total of like eight hours or ten hours total to get everything up to the roof, set up the whole fight ring, the sofas and everything, do the scenes, and then bring everything back down. And then bring, bringing everything back down because it's small elevators, right? Freight elevators. It takes, I think, like 15 or 20 different times to go up. So it takes an hour and a half to take everything up and down each time. So that 10 hour turned into like six hours. And then, you know, I mean, just it's just the nature of it. Right. And we're trying to do something crazy, you know, with with the limited budget that we have. So, um, you know, that was a really, really tough night. Um, yeah, that was that was tough. And then also the rain, the scene, the flashback scene for Tar. When we were shooting in the rain, um, shooting in the rain, just obviously like, you know, it wasn't real rain, but it was, it just intensifies it. You can't hear what what's happening. We're out in the middle of the jungle, basically, you know, out in the country, super far out of town, um, no cell service. And so like, it's just, you know, things just stopped working. I think we were running low on water from the water truck spraying the rain. So like the rain quit early. And so um, the kids standing there at the end, looking at the guy who was shot that wasn't actually the original ending to the scene the kid was supposed to take the gun and we ran out of rain man we ran out ran out of water so we ended up flipping it uh and and yeah this is where i was talking about we got it we we had to lean creatively in order to solve the problems but it, it still worked and the audience is not going to know you. any different yeah no not until now <laughs> yeah and uh, yeah exactly yeah. but uh yeah yeah because even when when the character, I'm not going to give it away, when he walks yeah. out into the forest or yeah. jungle, whatever Thailand wants to call it. Um, yeah, the country. I, yeah. yeah, the country. We'll call it that. Uh, yeah. I just like the fact that um, you kept an element of surprise. Mm. And, um, of course, I'm not going to give it away, but I was thinking, okay, now I want to see a sequel. <laughs> cool. I would love to, I'd love to explore that story, man. That was a, that was a fun, I mean, that was a fun scene. You know, we got the production value we were after, 
um you know it, it's it was fun man i, I really like that that's probably actually one of my most favorite scenes in the movie um yeah it was just great it's, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful cinematic filling scene to me so well it yeah especially now when you did the overhead shots going in going out into the country was that yeah. done by drone yeah yeah that was all drone cool all drone yeah i've talked to a helicopter pilot who works out of hollywood so i always try to think okay are they doing this by helicopter are they doing it by drone but uh usually but we don't have with the, the drone budget for helicopter <laughs> yeah the, you know the yeah. drone shots are usually extremely smooth and they have mm -hmm. that speed where you get that cinematic feel. I guess helicopters are more for action shots. But with Hellhound, yeah. where can everybody see this film? Uh, so it's out on Apple TV, Amazon Prime, uh, Fandango, which is Vudu now. Uh, I think Google Movies, uh, YouTube Movies, and then Microsoft Movies. There's a few places. Um, if you just pretty much, I mean, if you search for it online, you'll be able to find it. No problem. It's all VOD. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's uh, it's pretty much available anywhere. This is all North America, right? So anywhere in North America, U.S., Canada. Um, globally, it'll be releasing probably in about five months uh, th throughout the rest of the world. Oh, great, great. I mean, we have we have we have a great global audience when it comes to online, which is the greatest thing about online. You can reach everybody across this yeah. planet. But for you, yeah, what yeah. what new projects do you have coming up? Uh, so we've, we've got a few. I, I can't really talk about them right now um, because they're actually almost ready to be announced. Uh, but there's a there's a really cool sci fi movie uh, that we're working on. That these are these are two that I'm directing. And then there's another one that uh, it looks like we're we're just about to uh, set it up. Um, so there's two projects, right? One's a it's another thriller and then the other's a sci fi movie. Um, I, I can't say anything about it. I wish I could. Um, but then our, our development company, we have, uh, there's 10, 10 films on our slate currently. Um, one's a Burmese film. that's going to be really, really cool. Um, and then we've got a Thai action remake from a movie of, of, in the nineties. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, you can actually just go to the website and you can see our slate on, on there as uh, peripheralpictures.com. So there's, there's a film slate on the website. So kind of give me a little bit of uh, background history with uh, Bangkok, for example. Yeah. Is it more, because I've never been. So is it more like Hong Kong and uh, are they filled with movie theaters like we are here in America? Um, so Thailand's got tons of movie theaters, tons of shopping malls. Uh, it's extremely modern in Bangkok, um, and it, but it's interlaced with, you know, traditional Thai elements you'll see a old buddhist temple that's been there for 200 years you know in the middle of nowhere so like this guy it's kind of like hong kong in that way right but it's also very very modern um but thailand has has gone the opposite direction as far as like how how consumers operate and behave with shopping malls and cinemas right in the u.s that stuff's been going down for the last five to ten years shopping malls have you know a lot of them have shuttered and completely shut up or sh you know shut down here they're opening tons of new shopping malls um so you can't take the train and stop without a station they're all connected to the train stations nearly um and i mean these are shopping malls not like you have in america these things are all 10 stories tall they're massive you know um they they're full of Louis Vuitton stores and all these other really, really expensive, you know, brands, um, uh, you know, super high end stuff that I, I'm never wear, you know, shop for. So, um, it's, it's, it's the exact opposite. The, the trends here are very different. So each shopping mall has got a huge cinema at the top of it too, um, with at least 10 screens. So, um, it's the exact opposite of, what you've seen in the u.s so it's, it's really cool for me to be here because like i have I, I can i can go to a bunch of different type of cinemas here yeah so i, I love it as a, as a film, filmmaker which means that and so that means let's just say with bangkok in general people yeah. love going to the movies i would say so it's an experience they love going out they love shopping and they love going to the movies all it's a yeah they love they love movies here man they absolutely love it yeah, here I think they've gotten a little lazy. I think we're probably uh, mall weary. So a lot of people just rather just go mm -hmm. online and shop. 
And, uh, and I know the yeah. theaters are hoping to bring in more film in America to hopefully fill up the seats again. So uh, I know I, the pandemic is pretty so. bad. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. It's 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 something that's kind of really, really sad to me, you know, like the not 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 going to the cinema anymore. And, you know, streamers are great because they help, you know, with a lot of any projects. But like at the same time, it's you know, it's disheartening. It's it's you know, I don't I don't like it, man. I I there's nothing like seeing a movie on a on a on a theater or in a theater, you know, on a big screen. Yeah, it's, you know, movie making has really changed because you had the films that are created to go to the theater. Then we right. see all of the films that are literally, they just go straight to streaming. And yeah. you, and sometimes I think, I'm thinking with some of those films, why did you even waste the money making them? And, <laughs> you know, because to me, I call it filling in the blanks because yeah. here in America... Streaming has become the audience has become the beast and yeah. you have to feed the beast because once they see something, they're yeah. not really going to watch it again until maybe if they really liked it, they may watch it again. But yeah, it's yeah. constant content that you have to feed, which is why Netflix and the rest of them sit on mountains of debt. Yeah, well, of course, that's the whole startup model, right? Like that's just how they they operate. And I mean, you just highlighted it. They're startups, right? They're not, they're not, they're not trying to, they're not profitable. They're not, um, it's a whole, this is a whole, you know, a whole thing that, that I can go into and talk about forever. And, and, and I have so many mixed feelings on it, man. You know, it's just kind of like what, what, what I feel like at the day on, on, you know, each day it's, it's, it's just, I don't know, man. No, I, no, uh, no. I, I miss movies in the theaters. No, I, I agree. I completely agree with that. And and you said it best. They have it's basically a startup model that they've mm -hmm. never corrected. They can only yeah. live off the amount of subscribers that they have. And mm -hmm. the subscriber count goes up and down. They technically yeah. don't release those numbers because nope. that that Not goes into residuals. Yep. to actors and things of that oh yeah so, so as, it's as soon as they start yeah yeah no exactly as soon as they start releasing numbers everyone's going to start behaving differently um from the people who make the movies to the people who view it and um you know that's why they don't because it's it, it's literally the startup game they want to outperform each other and they're willing to keep losing money over money until or you know they keep losing money repeatedly until the others give up um so that they can take market share um, it's, 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 it's a startup, man. They're startups. Well, did, did the SAG strike? Or the startup uh, models. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Did the SAG strike cause any problems for you in Thailand? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we couldn't, we, there, there was, you know, like I said, the sci-fi movie, right. We were trying to get it off the ground and it was just like really, really close. And then the strike happened and we couldn't, uh, send out any offers to, to any of the talent. So any of the actors. So, um, they ended up having a uh, uh, they ended up letting independent films still uh, make offers um, or they were the sorry that the SAG actors were still able to take offers from independent for independent films. But it was still it was just still hard, man. Um, I think that they're still still recovering from it right now. Like if you see the amount of movies that are in the cinemas that didn't get made, um, there's still a major, major gap. Um, there was someone at a, so I was at a screening probably about two months ago. Uh, and there was someone here in Thailand that was from, I think it was from universal or something. Uh, and they were saying that there is a gap in like, there's, there's a huge gap. Like there's less than half of the movies available that they were able to be, uh, to put in the cinemas normally at the time. So like, there's, there's a huge gap right now for, for films. So like, this is actually a bit of a gold rush situation, right? So if you can get a movie made, it's going to be a lot easier right now to get your movie in the cinemas or to get people or studios to look at buying them buyers because there's, there's a, there's, there's not many movies right now. So like, I don't know, probably maybe there's a year left in that, maybe, maybe even less, but. Yeah, and a lot of films got pushed back. I know some films are going to yep. get released in February. Some are going to wait until May and June that were ready to go last year. But because sure. a lot of the actors, they couldn't do press junkets. So they have yep. well-known talent 
but they need yeah. that talent to be part of the press. So they had to push yeah, these things course. back. So yeah. I think with, um, you're right. There was, was a, going to be this gap for the summer, especially. No, 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 definitely. I mean, it was, it was a perfect storm, right? Cause like when, when the, when the strike ended, then we started run, we immediately ran into Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, like it was the most horrible time for it to have ended. Right. So like there was another two or three months of dead space where no one wants to go and do anything, you know? So, so like, and, and the movie stars aren't going to go do stuff in Christmas time, you know, like they're, they're, they're not going to do that. So, um, yeah, so you you were left with like, you know, it was just a, it was bad, man. It's bad. Um, we're now, I mean, right now it's pretty cool. Cause like now we're starting to feel the momentum. It's starting to catch up. Um, and so it's, it's exciting in that way, but like there was a good four or five months where we were just like, what are we doing? We're just like trying to develop stuff and we can't, we can't get anywhere. Well, yeah, even, even on our end, we had to wait. I mean, we, I mean, yeah, as long as you could interview someone that is not a SAG member. Yeah. It was fine. I mean, with Luis and I had another right. actor, we did interviews, I mean, probably two weeks to a month before the strike happened. So then when right. we actually released them, we had to post them as pre-strike interviews so no one would get in trouble. But then yeah, after yeah. the strike was over, we had to work all the way through the holidays because there was so many films, uh, TV series that needed press. And, mm. you know, most publicists take the, two, the last two weeks off of the year, but they didn't this year. Yeah, no, no, no. For sure. Yeah. It, but, it was it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joshua, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your film Hellhound and giving us a little bit more backstory, not only on the film, but also uh, Thailand's film industry as well. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It was great. I, uh, I enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. And hey, ladies and gentlemen, if your level of being entertained falls into the category of action films, Hellhound is worth your time. Hellhound is a well-balanced film with the right characters, an actual storyline, and enough action to keep you tense and on edge. So ladies and gentlemen, you can catch all of the replays of our interviews with the top film directors like Joshua Dixon and producers and screenwriters, even actors and more on our website at bondoncinema.com. And we're also available on YouTube as well as a dozen audio platforms as well. So I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me, hey, I'll see you at the movies. I've been an evil man for so long. And there's no turning back. I don't know much about salvation. But my sins are too great to be forgiven. I'm here on a job. It's my last job. Last one, and I'm done. For the last ride. For the last ride. Who's the target? He's the kingpin, a dangerous man. Drugs, illegal fighting, human trafficking, you name it. No, no. <laughs> Prodigal son returns home. I need you to help me find someone. Sometimes you cannot win. That doesn't wait for anybody. He's not an easy man to kill. This isn't a job anymore. It's turned into a war. There are three types of man. Ordinary man, fearful. Brave man, fighter. And lastly, a man so determined he embraces violence. This is going to be my grand finale. How many of you want to die tonight? Come on! <laughs>